Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 6 Sumer, Cradle of Civilization. By the year 5000 BC, people around the world are transitioning out of Stone Age life and into something a bit more civilized. That's in the literal meaning of the word, not as in raising their pinkies sipping tea, but actually building cities. From the bountiful plenty of agriculture come settlements popping up in diverse sites like Pakistan, China, Malta, and all around the coast of the Black Sea. Many of these societies will grow and flourish, others will simply vanish from history, either having been absorbed by another group or destroyed and scattered to the winds of time. And then there were those who lived in the region between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, whose extraordinary successes would come not from a life of easy abundance, but from the sweat of their collective brows. Nowadays, this is the land of southern Iraq, and in ancient times, with so many locations so well suited for easy living, why stop here? The temperatures could be oppressively hot in the day, and then drop to freezing at night. Rivers could flood, change courses, or just dry out. Marshes and swamps teemed with aggressive, biting insects, festering with diseases like malaria, dengue fever, the boogie-woogie flu. That last one's made up, but you get my point. And probably worst of all were that basic resources are sparse. Stone, timber, and metal, all necessary for a civilization to flourish. And there's not much of it here. And yet, remarkably, when the first settlers arrived, they all agreed. The land was good. Later generations would come to call this place ki en -Nir, the land of the noble lords. To the later Akkadian people, who will one day be their conquerors, this land is called Shumeru, which is where we get our name for it, Sumer. The origins of these settlers are mysterious, but one thing is certain. Sumer was not founded by Sumerians. Yeah, crazy, right? Now I know this because the names of the earliest cities, Ur, Lagash, Nippur, are not Sumerian words. Even the names of the two rivers, Idiglat and Buranan, are not Sumerian. That is the language of those very first inhabitants of Sumer, whose name is unknown to history. Well, they gotta be called something, so they used to be called the Pre-Euphradians, but now are called the Ubaid people, after the site where the first discovery of their existence was found. It was these people who laid the groundwork for the earliest true civilization on Earth, a society of specialized workers, farmers, shepherds, craftsmen, smiths, potters, masons, priests, warriors, etc., all within a city supported by a surprisingly adept agricultural industry. And just like Rome wasn't built in a day, neither was Sumer. The first cities of the Ubaidian people, like Eridu and Ur, were built further south on the coast of the Persian Gulf where food was plentiful. Date palms and marsh reeds grew in abundance, and once they invented boats, the Gulf could open up exciting trade routes. Yet if you check a map today for their locations, you'll notice that the city ruins are way inland. So what gives? Well, it's not the towns that moved, but rather after thousands of years of the rivers depositing silt and debris at their deltas, the gulf has just been pushed further and further away. Location is the big thing in real estate, but that's only half the battle back in the ancient world. You might have selected the place to construct your cities, but what do you build them with? Here in Sumer, hmm, well, there's palm trees, good for fuel and oil, but not so good as a building material. The abundant marsh reeds could work, and people learned to weave almost anything from them. The endangered Madan people of Iraq, also sometimes called the Marsh Arabs, carry out this age-old tradition of constructing everything from the reeds, from the houses they live in to the floating islands on the marshes which hold the houses. But the Ubaidian people needed more than just palms and reeds. They needed to unlock the secret of the ooze. And by ooze, I mean mud. It didn't take long to figure out that mud dries out in the sun and hardens, packing off into a mold and voila, a brick is born. And to make these mud bricks even sturdier, other materials such as clay, sand, and plant fibers could be added. The earliest bricks were quite the novel concept, although no one realized that without oven firing the bricks at a hot temperature, every time there was a heavy rain, the settlement would literally melt away. Luckily it doesn't downpour that often here, and it's not like they're going to run out of mud, right? 
So eventually they did learn to make better mud bricks, and had another stroke of inspiration from the naturally occurring pools of this black, sticky stuff from the ground. Bitumen, also known as asphalt, is a natural petroleum product that works great as a sealant. This resource, alongside the fibrous plants of Sumer's marshes, were the secret behind the Sumerian success story. I'm not quite done talking about the Ubaidian people, but just on a tangent for a moment, eventually the Sumerians built up a reputation as masters of metallurgy. Which is kind of a weird thing to master when there's no metal where you live. But that's okay because you can just trade for it, which is what the Sumerians did. See, it turns out that not only is that mud great to build with, it's also really good to plant crops in. Like, seriously good. And with these consistent bumper crops, the Sumerians could simply trade for whatever they need, building economic ties with places as far away as India and Ethiopia. Oh, but the metallurgy, well, the Sumerians mastered that craft early on because they had a fuel source that could burn hot enough to smelt metal from rock ore. Bitumen and marsh reeds. Combine the two in a kiln, and you've got a flame perfect for tin and copper which creates bronze, the hard and sturdy alloy used so much in the ancient world that an entire period of time is named after it. The Bronze Age of Southwest Asia occurs between roughly 3600 to about 1200 BC, and it wraps up earlier than in Europe or Asia because one of the local civilizations, the Hittites, discover iron. Which is a game changer, though that's a story for a later episode. So the ancient people of Sumer have the tools to build their great cities, and first amongst them was Eridu. The city name translates to Mighty Place, which is a pretty good way to get residents to move in, but it's also a sacred religious center. Ea, the father of Marduk from chapter 1, lives here, and Inanna, the goddess of both love and war, makes sense when you think about it, well it's here that she learned the secrets of civilization to teach her followers. Education would be a cornerstone of Eridu, as the city was a place of learning and spirituality for thousands of years after its founding, even when the Babylonians eventually take over. Eridu, like most other Sumerian cities, began as a farming settlement, its citizens concerned only with the upkeep of the irrigation canals and with producing as much food as possible. The successes of those hard-working citizens caught the attention of various Semitic peoples from the Arabian Peninsula around 4500 BC who brought their tradition of sheep and goat herding to the city. This does not appear to have been an unwelcome arrival, and they mingled peacefully through intermarriage and cultural assimilation until about 500 years later, the people we recognize as Sumerians first appear. And luckily for us, they were fond of drawing their own people, and so we have an idea of what they looked like through their artwork. Men are commonly depicted as bald and hairless, though sometimes with cylindrical beards of thick, coarse hair, and wearing nothing but a skirt of wool or plant fibers. Women dressed equally as simple, wearing a linen dress, shoulders uncovered, and hair pulled back into a bun. Sumerian ethnic fusion didn't just stop there, because as fortune continued to shine on Sumer, people from all over flocked to the cities, contributing their own various skills and learning to this triumph of civilization. There was so much intermingling, in fact, that Eridu is hypothesized as where the Tower of Babel, that legendary monument to man's hubris, might have existed. Probably wasn't as tall as they say it was, but if you recall the outcome of that tale, it's an explanation of why humans speak so many different languages. Could it be that this story began as an allegory to explain the many different tongues no doubt spoken in Eridu? Perhaps the story was spread by some xenophobic and bitter Ubaidian, a holdout from the old days, angry at the cosmopolitan face of what used to be his city. I'm just thinking out loud here, but there actually is a Babel myth in Sumerian folklore concerning a king of Uruk wishing to build a massive tower in Eridu for the purposes of creating one unified language from all the bordering states of Sumer. There probably was never a giant tower that was cast down, but there were the tiered pyramidal structures of the Sumerians and Babylonians, the ziggurats. Maybe one was built bigger than the rest and the whole thing collapsed in an earthquake or something. Who knows? Now anyone who's ever played a simulation game like Sim City knows that if you had the chance to carefully plan the construction of a city, you'd put careful thought into road placement, zoning, and all the other details. The cities of ancient Sumer, on the other hand, just kind of evolved naturally. 
Houses and shops were built outside of farms and canals, and then came the large temple complexes with courtyards, living quarters for priests, workshops, specialized farms, and shrines to the gods, and, of course, the imposing ziggurats. Each Sumerian city had a ruling god, where he or she also lived. This isn't the same as a patron god, like with Athens and Athena. Oh no, the Sumerian gods literally dwelled in, ruled, and protected the city from harm. Good harvests and blessed unions were granted, provided the proper sacrifices and offerings were made. Nothing too weird here, the gods preferred food and beer. I mean, who wouldn't, right? But not just any food and beer would cut it. Anything that was offered to the gods needed to be not only blessed by the priests, but also grown, raised, or brewed by the priests too. It was like a whole other dimension to keeping kosher. And since the priests were the only ones who could understand the whims and wishes of the heavens, they naturally had substantial power and authority over the citizenry. It's sort of a Bronze Age theocracy, but it isn't so much about priests hoarding power, but instead them acting as supervisors, overseeing the most important part of Sumerian life farming. Under their edicts, priests could decide how much food could be distributed against how much to store in the granaries. If the irrigation canals needed maintenance or expansion and no extra labor was available, they had the power to draft citizens for labor. Or enslave, whichever word you feel more comfortable with. And while rounding up independent citizens for mandatory menial work might sound harsh, if the irrigation canals failed, no one eats. So yeah, the priests didn't have any qualms about doing this. Now it used to be that historians thought the priests owned the majority of city territory and would rent out the land for its use and enslave anyone who failed to make payments. But newly translated tablets don't seem to support this anymore. If anything, most of the land was privately owned for those citizens to use it or lease it out as they wished. The absence of any recorded revolts or riots against this corporate theocracy may very well indicate that people were quite content with their religious society and leaders. Good thing for the priest class. And in their vital role dealing with food distribution and management, it is believed that around 3500 BC, the Sumerian priest classes invented writing. Necessity being the mother of invention, of course, well, keeping track of all this food would be nearly impossible without some kind of recording system. Ah, but you see, that can mean so many different things. Initially, the Sumerians used various clay tokens to represent goods, such as grain, beer, animals, slaves, and how much of something there was. When two people wished to exchange their goods or produce, they took the tokens they needed, sealed them up in these hollow clay balls, stamped it with their personal symbol, and baked the whole thing up. In essence, it's a signed contract without the need for literacy. Well, but maybe you think that Namkazu, the date farmer, stiffed you on the sale, but you can't prove it without breaking the ball open, which would void the contract. Easy solution, the Sumerians say. Just start pressing the images of whatever tokens are inside onto the surface of the ball. That way you know exactly what's inside without needing to break it open. Yeah, are you seeing it too? If we're just putting an image of whatever is contained in the clay ball on the very surface of the clay ball, well, why don't we just write on the clay and forget the whole stupid token thing in the first place? The very first written tablets featured pictograms, symbols that look like the object they represent. Boats, water, and animals are just a few of the featured images in this early system, and it worked for a while, although having to draw every thought you wish to express takes a lot of time and skill. The development of writing continued to progress until the introduction of cuneiform script. This wedge-shaped writing style was pioneered by the Sumerians, who would take a wedge-shaped stylus and press it into wet clay for a faster, more efficient way to record their thoughts which were not particularly deep thoughts, at least not yet. They were mostly financial transactions. And yes, while the Sumerians are considered the first civilization to discover writing, other civilizations came up with the technology on their own, without any outside influence, like the Chinese, the Egyptians, and the Olmecs or Zapotecs in Mesoamerica. All right, so we know writing is useful for trade, but it's also a great way to record information and knowledge to be passed down through the ages, which means recorded history. And the Sumerians were kind enough to provide a wide range of texts for future generations to read, detailing many various aspects of their lives. 
We have cuneiform tablets of farmer's almanacs, fables, even medicinal texts describing the ingredients and application uses of various salves, liquids, and powders. No mention of what diseases they cured, but a really neat thing is there's no mention of magic or spells as a cure. The author of this medical tablet was pretty confident that his medicines would treat all sorts of ailments and afflictions. And maybe they did. I can't speak for the success rate, seeing as how beer was the main ingredient in most of these cures, but kudos for at least attempting to play at science. So the development of writing is great, except there is a snag. You also need people who know how to do it. With most folk working on the farms or in some kind of skill-based trade, there's simply no time to learn how to read and write. It's unfortunate, too, because this means that literacy is the province of the privileged few. Throughout history, this will be a common theme of the social hierarchy, those who can read against those who can't. Nowadays, we take literacy for granted, and free public schools ensure that even the most underprivileged aspiring reader is given the chance to learn. But that's not how it was for most of history, especially not in Sumer, where education was only for the rich and well-connected. Students were generally the sons of temple administrators, military officers, tax officials, and wealthy merchants. Also, sorry girls, education is a boys-only deal. Although truthfully, you might not want to have attended a Sumerian school. Let me show you what I mean. The school was set up to mimic a family structure, with the headmaster, or umia, also called the school father, professors are considered the older brothers, and finally the students, considered to be the school sons. In addition, there were also truant officers and a disciplinarian whose name translates as man in charge of the whip, which is fairly ominous, but truant officers already? Yeah, because even back in the days of the very first schools, kids skipped class and goofed off. Curriculum was divided into three fields of study, math, science, and writing. At this time, the Sumerians finally learned other uses for writing, like poetry, but also made a point to teach biology, geography, and the earth sciences. Sumerian math was based on a sexagesimal numerical system, where 60 is the base number. It dealt primarily with arithmetic and geometry until the introduction of the more advanced teachings of Babylonian mathematicians. The sexagesimal system, by the way, carries over today in certain forms, like how there are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 360 degrees in a circle, and so on. Now, the reason I can tell you all this oddly specific information about the Sumerian educational system is that many tablets survive to this day. We even know about student life from tablets found from around 2000 BC, recorded by a Sumerian teacher. He writes about this one student who starts his day late, rushing his mother to pack a lunch, two bread rolls, and panics about getting to class on time. He expresses dread about being late, and I quote, lest his teacher cane him. Apparently, this boy has received quite a bit of corporal punishment already for being disruptive and for doing poorly in class. It turns out that his penmanship, or wedge stylusmanship, is not that good, and his teacher tries his best to encourage the young pupil, writing, Be industrious in the scribal art, and it will provide you with wealth and abundance. Work hard for it, and it will reveal to you its beautiful prosperity. It's something teachers say to this very day. Stay in school, study hard, and when you grow up, you'll have a nice paying job. Of course, this kid didn't know anything about the joys of student loans and collection agencies, but I digress. The story of this unmotivated student continues on. Now he's really worried about his grades, so he talks to his dad about a solution. Instead of planning to study more and put nose to grindstone, they invite the teacher over for a delicious dinner, and at the opportune moment present him with new clothing and a shiny new ring. Oh, how'd those get there? In case you're wondering, teacher pay was as modest back then as it is today, and maybe even more so because the teacher is moved by this bribe, uh, I mean, display of generosity. He speaks. Young man, because you did not neglect my word, did not forsake it, may you reach the pinnacle of the scribal art. May you achieve it completely. Because you gave me that which you were by no means obliged to give, you presented me with a gift over and above my earnings and have shown me great honor. Of your brothers, may you be their leader. Of your companions, may you be their chief. 
and may you rank the highest of all the schoolboys. Well, kid, I used to think you were a deadbeat and a slacker, but it turns out I really like this ring. You get an A+. Obviously, this wouldn't go over so well in modern society, but it doesn't seem like this teacher was viewed as corrupt, or this was an isolated incident, because this story has been found on at least 21 separate tablets. Maybe spread by ancient helicopter parents looking for ways to cozy up to their son's teacher? Well, still, it's a fascinating glimpse into an ancient society. Alright, we've seen Sumerian technological achievements, city planning, and now education. Ingredients for a decent civilization, although there's gonna be a need for some law and order. We talked a bit about how the priest class ran the city in sort of an overseer way, although they were not the only ones. The Sumerians are also notable for having a sort of proto-republic of sorts. In times of crisis, typically war, a bicameral congress would be convened, where the upper house was made of those too old to fight, and the lower house made of male citizens able to bear arms. They'd argue their points back and forth about whatever topic of discussion before an appointed war chief called a Lugal, translated as the big man, would then decide what to do. The Lugal was originally quite similar to the Roman concept of a dictator, someone who was invested with supreme power to deal with a national emergency and then expected to surrender that power once the problem is over. <laughs> well, you can imagine that one of these Lugals must have gotten the idea to just not give up that power, and no one seemed to mind too much. In this way, the cities of Sumer shifted towards monarchy, where the kingship would be centered around a specific city-state until another city-state rose in power to make a bid for the throne, and then they'd have it for a certain length of time. It's all very Game of Throny, and we're very fortunate that the history of this struggle survives in the form of the Sumerian King List a massive collection of the names, dates, and accomplishments of their numerous leaders. Though not all of it has survived, and not all of it makes sense, there is still plenty to form a pretty comprehensive story of a region that rarely knew peace. In the earliest days of Sumer, there were five cities, Eridu, Bad Tabira, Larak, Sippar, and Shurapak. More cities would arise, like Uma and Uruk, but for now, those five cities and the eight kings that called them home would all vie for dominance over a grand total of 385,000 years. Uh, just humor me here. Eridu is first ruled by Alulim. When it's Bad Tabira's turn to take power, their king is named Dumuzid, also called Dumuzi or Tamuts the Shepherd, who rules for 36,000 years. He's a particularly interesting character who is so well-loved throughout the land that he became a god. His ritual worship continued way past Sumer's downfall, into Babylonian-occupied Jerusalem, and from there into the writings of an angry biblical prophet. To understand just how a mythical Sumerian king ended up a blasphemous pagan deity in the Old Testament, let's look at his backstory and how a justifiably livid wife sealed his fate. As a mortal, Demuzi was able to court and marry Inanna, the love and war goddess. Their magical union fertilized the land and food grew plentiful and there was much rejoicing. Content with things on earth, Inanna went to visit the netherworld to see her older sister Ereshkigal, queen of the dead. Well, she didn't really want to, but rather Inanna wanted to see if she could learn the secrets of the underworld from her sister, although getting to her was a fair challenge in its own right. To reach Ereshkigal's throne room, one must pass through seven gates of diminishing size, which required the visitor to remove their jewelry and clothing. When Inanna finally reached her sister, crawling out of the tiny seventh gate, it was on her hands and knees, naked. Humiliated, Inanna calls for her sister to meet her where she stands, so as to not expose herself further. Ereshkigal rises and walks over to her, but aha! Inanna races past her sister and quickly jumps on the throne, hoping to absorb its power. Instead, the Anunnaki, the seven judges of the underworld, appeared, screaming at her with an otherworldly fury, for Inanna had violated the rules of the underworld. Their judgment was swift, and in unison they locked eyes upon her, gazing at her body with a horrifying glare until their magic had turned Inanna into a corpse, and she was hung off a hook. All was not lost for the goddess, for she had warned her servant, Nin Shubur, that if she did not return in three days, to send for help. 
Nin Shibur convinced Ea to resurrect her by sending down two creatures with the food and drink of life. This worked and Inanna was no longer a corpse, but she was still bound by the laws of the underworld. She had died in the realm of the dead. The only way she could leave was if someone took her place. Inanna was granted a temporary leave to return to Sumer, escorted by demons, to find someone willing to take her place. She first pleaded with the gods of Uma and Bad Tabira, but they beg her not to take them from their homes. She is moved by their requests and agrees to spare them. Although every city she visited, it seemed that no one would help her, and Inanna was too sympathetic to anyone's wishes against taking her place. Despondent, she returned to Uruk, her home city only to find her husband, Demutsi, asleep in the midday sun against a tree. Apparently, the disappearance of his wife over the last few days wasn't keeping him up at night, and in a fit of rage over his lack of concern, Inanna orders her demon escorts to drag him to the underworld as her replacement. Demutsi awakens in time and hightails it over to the house of his sister, Geshtanana. Barricaded within, Geshtanana begs for her brother's safety, and even Utu, Inanna's brother and Demutsi's brother-in-law, tries to intervene, but too late. The demons are able to break into the house, whereupon they grab Demutsi and beat him to death, dragging his soul down into the underworld. Although, wait, now Geshtanana pleads with Inanna to take her brother's place instead. A truly noble and selfless deed. Finally, it is decided that Demutsi and his sister will split the punishment. He will spend half the year in the underworld, and Geshtanana will spend the other half. Inanna finds this arrangement fair, except once her blind rage settles down, she quickly finds herself grieving for her imprisoned husband. It is during these six months of the year, where Inanna is mourning for Demutsi, that she neglects the earth, as the rivers dry up, the land grows barren, and the days become colder. In addition to this being a season's myth and an allegory for why hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, the lamentation of Demutsi was an important religious occasion for the Sumerians and is thought to have been a month-long celebration of his resurrection and mourning of his death. And as I indicated earlier, this continued well after the sun set on the Sumerians and was continued with the Babylonian conquests. The names might change, but the story does not. Inanna becomes Ishtar, and Dumuzi becomes Tamuz, and his cult spreads to the west and into the land of Judea. His cult was so strong that even in 600 BC Jerusalem, the prophet Ezekiel discovers that women are still in mourning over their fallen god. As written in Ezekiel 8.14, He brought me to the north gate of the Lord's temple, and I saw women sitting there, mourning for Tamuz. Well, regardless if it's Tamuz or Demutsi, he lives on today. His name is given to the fourth month of the Hebrew calendar, which was adopted from the Babylonian calendar. Does it seem strange that an ancient pagan god is on a strictly monotheistic religion's calendar? Well, what are Mars, Janus, Odin, Freya, and other Roman and Norse gods and goddesses doing on the Gregorian calendar? It's just hard to shake off some traditions. The first eight rulers on the Sumerian king list are known as the Antediluvian kings, with Ubaratutu, king of Shuripak, being the last before the Great Flood. The Sumerians believed there was a massive deluge that destroyed the world at some point, much like the story in the Old Testament. And just like Noah, a man named Utnapishtim is given plans to build an ark of his own by Ea and told to take two of every animal and load them up. Is this sounding familiar? Once this flood receded and mankind recovered, Kish becomes the first of the post-flood city-states to take power, and the name of its first king is Gishur, who ruled for 1,200 years. Now, the first archaeologically recognized king is Etana of Kish, who is dated to around 3000 BC. He who stabilized the lands was a semi-legendary figure who was blessed with wisdom, but not fertility. He sought out a magical plant that provided him with a son, uh, somehow, named Enme Baragesi, who waged a successful war against the Elamites to the east. Further down the list, Aga of Kish is defeated by Meski Angesher of Uruk, he who entered the seas and ascended the mountains. His son, Emmerkar, further built up Uruk and subjugated Arata, a city-state that is yet to be discovered by archaeologists. 
Enmerkar's companion in arms is named Lugalbanda, who is granted super speed by a lion headed Ansu bird, and by 2400 BC has been deified after marrying Ninsun, a goddess of health and healing. Lugalbanda's great and all, but he's a pipsqueak compared to the awesome splendor that is his son, the greatest of the Sumerian kings. How great is he? Why, he's so great that he gets his very own episode. And that means next time we'll take a pause from the history to hear the world's oldest epic story. This is a disjointed, broken tale from fractured tablets and fragmented sentences that was made mostly complete by dedicated scholars. What survives is a tale of an arrogant hero, made humble by the bonds of friendship, high adventure, daring encounters with the gods, and a quest to acquire the one thing all mortals desire but will never have, a chance at immortality. A tale this epic needs to truly live up to the name, and so I am joined by my history podcaster friends to do it justice. So if you're ready for an exciting adventure with fearsome monsters, amorous goddesses, hairy beastmen, and so much more, well grab a flagon of ale and a haunch of mutton and settle in for the Epic of Gilgamesh on the podcast history of our world.